means that you set the mandatory data rate at 11 megabits per second and you disable any data rates that are below 11 megabits per second. Now, if you don't have any legacy 802.11b devices operating, then you can set your mandatory data rate at 24 megabits per second and you should disable any data rates below 24 megabits per second. And then you would do the same thing in the 5 gigahertz band. Now we talk about doing two different types of site surveys. One is a passive site survey and the other is an active site survey. And as the passive one suggests, is one where you're listening. So you are put up your access points and you listen to the received signal strength. You listen to the interference between two access points that are operating on the same frequency. In a passive site survey, your client is basically just listening and it doesn't send out anything. The most it might send out may be a few probe requests. Now with an active site survey, the client will actually be sending data. And so it'll be sending data to the access point and similarly receiving data from the access point. If you're sending data backwards and forwards, then you can go beyond just measuring the RF and actually measure the performance of your data. So you can start looking at packet loss and packet delays and packet error rates. So an active site survey will give you a lot more insight into the performance of the wireless LAN. In order to do a passive and an active survey, in addition to having the access point, I also need now a Wi-Fi adapter for my client device. And I don't need any special equipment. I can use a standard off-the-shelf Wi-Fi adapter. And if you're deploying dual mode access points, you'll want to make sure that that adapter operates both in the 2.4 and the 5 gigahertz band. And to make your site survey a little bit quicker, you want to make sure that that Wi-Fi adapter can transmit simultaneously in the 2.4 and the 5 gigahertz band. So with this approach, if this was your floor plan, and so it's a rectangular shape in this example, you'd start by putting your access point in one of the corners. You would then look to find out where the cell boundary was. And then you would move your access point to that cell boundary. You then restart your measurements and you can see by moving it to the cell boundary, you now have coverage all the way to the corner. And so this becomes your first access point placement. You then repeat that for all four corners of the floor and then you fill in between. And remember, you would go for a 10 to 15% overlap if you were doing data applications and a 20% overlap if you're doing voice in the 2.4 gigahertz band. A little bit less, 15%, if you're in the 5 gigahertz band. This second approach is sometimes called aisle coverage. This works really well in places like warehouses and factory floors where you literally have rows of equipment or shelving. And you can see in this illustration that I've placed my access points on the wall and then I'm using something like a Yagi antenna to give me a very directional beam that's going down the aisles of my warehouse. Now, if my warehouse was very large, then I can always go to this kind of model where now I'm placing an access point at both ends of the aisle. Now, I have worked in some manufacturing environments where the manufacturing site was so large, even though the, we did this with the Yagi antennas, we still needed to place some access points in the middle with omnidirectional antennas. So you really have to take a look and see what kind of coverage you're getting and then determine whether you want to use Yagi antennas or a combination of Yagi and Omni antennas in lo very large locations like factory floors, etc. So this next technique of placing access points is affectionately known as AP on a stick.
It works very well if you have an irregular shaped building. So unlike the rectangle ones that we were looking at in the previous illustrations. So the first thing you want to do is place your first access point and basically just choose a good RF environment or somewhere where there's not much interference, somewhere where it's connected to an Ethernet cable so you can power the access point. Then what you do is once you've placed your first access point, you said, OK, I've got my coverage. I know where my cell boundary is. Then you go in one direction and place your next access point. So in this illustration, I've gone directly upwards and I've now found the location for my next access point. And again, I determined the cell boundary. I then go back to my original access point and repeat this process. So I choose another direction. In this case, I'm going away from the wall. I place the access point there and then I do my cell boundaries estimates yet again. Again, I have to worry about overlapping cell coverage depending on whether I'm doing voice or data. And basically, I just continue this process incrementally moving in different directions until I've completed the coverage that I need. So we've now looked at three quite different approaches. The first one was the outside in. Then we looked at how to do aisle coverage. And we just finished up here looking at AP on a stick. So with these three approaches, you should be pretty good to place your access points regardless of what the shape and what the type of construction that you're in. Now, on the next couple of slides, I want to take you through some best practices which will really help you in your placement of access points as part of conducting your Layer 2 site survey. And the first best practice has to do with when you lay your access point and you're starting to take measurements. Now, when you're taking measurements, and in this illustration, we're looking at a voice over wireless LAN, you're looking for the cell boundary. And in the case of voice, that would be minus 67 dBm. The best practice is to keep walking further away from the access point beyond the cell boundary. And what you're looking for is you're looking for the edge of a cell where you can deploy an access point on the same frequency that your first access point is on. So in this illustration, as I mentioned, we're looking at a voice over wireless LAN. And as we know, we want at least minus 86 dBm cell separation. And so if you walk away from your access point and find the location where the signal drops to minus 86 dBm, that will tell you where the cell boundary must be if you're going to deploy another access point on the same frequency channel as this first access point that you're deploying. So again, when you're deploying wireless LANs, not only measure for the cell boundary of the access point that you're actually placing, but also walk further away and measure where the cell boundary would have to be for another access point that's going to operate in the same frequency channel, but some distance away. So you can get an assessment of what that distance has to be. So the other technique is you want to be as accurate as you can with taking these measurements. The more accurate you are, the better your survey results will be. Having said that, you need to balance the number of measurements that you're taking with the complexity of your RF environment. Yes, more data points will improve the accuracy, but it will actually take longer to perform and will actually increase the complexity of how you're going to analyze those results. So balance it between the number of measurements, how long it takes you to do the analysis to look at what those measurements mean with the complexity of the RF environment. The more complex the RF environment, the more measurements you want to make. The other thing is you don't really need to listen to every channel. Look at the channel 
that you've found in when you did your layer one site survey that is the cleaner spectrum in that location and then look at the channels that you plan to deploy on the surrounding cells. This will make it a lot quicker for you to work out your site survey. And the other technique, I cannot tell you how many times I've seen people do this, is really important that you measure the data for every access point that you're deploying. If you skip one, there's a real danger when you come back, you're going to find holes in your coverage, or maybe you're going to find too much co-channel interference. You need to measure the data for every access point in the area that you're deploying. So let's now look at a few key terms. Co-channel interference. This is the interference between two access points that are operating on the same frequency. So let's say I've deployed on channel 1 in the 2.4 gigahertz band my access point, and then I want to deploy another access point on the same frequency some distance away. It's a measure of how those two access points interfere with each other. The Cisco Compatible Extensions is a Cisco certification program. Now, the Cisco products conform to the standards such as 80211, but the Cisco products also have a range of additional features that Cisco's added to their product. Now, if you're looking to see if a client device or maybe a phone is optimized to work with the Cisco wireless LAN, then one of the ways to see that is if it's been certified with this Cisco program to be compatible with the Cisco access point features. And then the last term is the fade margin. And we talked about that earlier in this lesson. This is the margin that caters for the fluctuation of your signal strength because the RF environment is changing all the time. People are walking around, people are moving equipment and by putting in a fade margin it allows you to cater for those factors and ensure that your wireless LAN will perform in a changing RF environment. So what did we do in this lesson? Well, we started talking about how to perform a manual layer 2 site survey. And we talked about how you can define the cell boundaries and place your access points. We also went through several best practices, such as making sure you capture the data for every access point that you're placing on your customer site.